So we're just going to talk about statutes, and we're going to talk about common law. Okay, so basically how it is is statutes were always for government, and they were designed to rein government in. And you can tell that it's like that because uh, look at what happened with Sue Gray. So Sue Gray goes and exposes something in statute that the government's not doing. So what did the government do? They moved the statute. And they do that every time. Now, why is that? Why do they have to keep moving the statute? Because it actually applies to them. Statutes were designed to point in towards government, to rein them in. Common law was designed to point out towards the people, people to people. Common law transgressions, torts, uh, trespass, you know, uh, all those things where you've broken your contracts or you've hurt people. Those are common law transgressions, right? The statutes were never designed to be pointed out at the people. They were always to rein government in. And you can tell that it's like that because every act says, this act binds the crown. It doesn't say this act binds Monica or this act binds Peter. No, what it says is this act binds the crown. So statutes are always pointing in at government. And the common law is always pointing out at the people. So when you've done a common law transgression, the government has the right to come and interdict and take control of that situation and take you back and uh, make remedy for the victim. The statute was never designed that way. They've, they've confused the issue and made statutes and common law have blurred lines so that they can then turn around and appoint, point the statutes out at the people and then make them apply to the people. Well, it's never, never was designed like that. So that's the thing. There's the main difference between common law and statute. As statutes are the rule of a society given the force of law. And that society is the law society and the government and the judiciary and all that are members. Right? You're not a member of the law society and neither am I. That's why it doesn't really apply to us. And, and it's clearly delineated. But the, the revenue gathering part of statute, which was always designed to be applied to the government for compensation for wrongdoings to the people, has now been turned around and become the main mechanism for government to gain money from the people is using that st statute profit mechanism. Should New Zealand's environmental policies include a ban on mining iron sand off the North Island's Taranaki coast? So Maori maintain customary claims, as you know, to the foreshore and have opposed the plan for years. How do you reconcile the rights of your people when you're in a role that requires you to defend the government of New Zealand? So it was back in 2004 when you did create a bit of controversy when you eventually voted for the New Zealand Foreshore and Seabed Act. I mean, that's something that the UN criticized. They released a report on that law stating that the law contained discriminatory aspects against the Maori. You were the chairperson of Maori Affairs at the time. Do you regret that vote? No, I don't. Chief. There's no explanation to when those people, um, <coughs> she, she did that process. They um, did the force rule on seabed, right? Which created a statute that gave government uh, further reach. You know, they pushed the bounds. And then that statute was found to be unlawful, i.e. common law. It breached a common law transgression, so it had to be wiped out. And they did that by putting another one in place called the Marine and Coastal Area Act, which had the same uh, racist um, premises within the statutes, but gave the obligatory common law uh, curing period for people to object to it.
i.e. the uh, newly implanted COVID legislation, which actually breaks the law. It breaches actual statute and common law. But if they get everybody to accept it by taking the vaccine, then it becomes law for everyone. And we lose all those rights and privileges we once had by our own admission. Maori maintain customary claims, as you know, to the foreshore and have opposed the plan for years. How do you reconcile the rights of your people when you're in a role that requires you to defend the government of New Zealand? So it was back in 2004 when you did create a bit of controversy when you eventually voted for the New Zealand Foreshore and Seabed Act. I mean, that's something that the UN criticized. They released a report on that law stating that the law contained discriminatory aspects against the Maori. You were the chairperson of Maori Affairs at the time.
it's still being used as a vehicle. The whole thing's being used as a vehicle to take away, you know, the, the, the processes from bondage to bondage, from slavery to slavery, okay? We've already been past freedom in the 17th century. Now we're heading right back into slavery again and people can't see it because they have clouded your judgments with fear. Those things are all really uh, fear. Okay. Peer pressure is the fear of being excluded. Increases your survival chances if you're not in a group. So new, human beings have a natural fear of being isolated. It's that. And because we're tribal, the, from the islands we're tribal, we like to be in a group. Human beings are tribal. Yeah. Every All of us. So what I'm saying is by by singling you out, and making you outside your peer group, that's peer pressure. The fear of not being part of a group, which definitely decreases your survival chances. They escaped justice. They murdered someone and got away with it. And they've never, not not any of those teams, not not anyone. That documentary we watched the other night on it, which you know, because I made you aware of it, that was like uh, ten years ago or something. But that was the first time anybody had apologised to the family of the man that was killed. In the Rainbow Warrior. Yeah. When did that happen, Peter? Uh, the eighty-five. Eighty-five. Well, if we think of it from a um, cultural perspective, we believe that the whales and the dolphins were our family. Now, when Nanaia Mahuta killed, the, like, sold the sea better than for sure, she murdered our family. That's the, exactly the same thing as what Greenpeace was doing out at Muraroa Atoll. They were trying to save the whales and dolphins who were getting irradiated by the uh, oh. nuclear explosions. How do you reconcile the rights of your people when you're in a role that requires you to defend the government of New Zealand? She's being put into a position, a CEO's position, basically, of um, taking care of the foreign affairs. And so, because she's a Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Foreign Affairs generally, not in this case, in New Zealand they're faking it, the sending states pretending to be the receiving state. Yeah. 
but forward affairs and trade is usually managed by the uh, receiving state. I know that. It's normally managed by the receiving state. And the minister, therefore, has dipl diplomatic immunity. In fact, all, all governmental offices only whilst in the commission of their duties have diplomatic immunity. But she was unelected, so what does that make her status, Peter? She's been put into a CEO's position. So she's um, corporate liability, then a CEO has corporate liability. They have a duty of care. So um, if in fact it's proven that um, that she had an intention to deceive for... Personal gain? Yes. She did that to me, Peter, because remember when That's we passed forward. the Kupapa suppression yeah. law... I had to the foreshore and seabed, maybe the same thing. Was when you sign off on the foreshore and seabed in the foreshore and seabed act and it's found to be unlawful because it's exploited to indigenous people right and then it gets removed because it was unlawful then why is she not removed and she made pecuniary gain on signing not unlawful as well so yeah those guys actually do all those unlawful things but because people are so used to being told that uh, those people are the ones in control, they just accept their unlawfulness as being normal. But and that's part of the corruption of our society. But the real power is at the marais, but then she controls all the marais because she controls the funding, eh? So all marais come under Tapuni Kokiri, which comes under Nanai Mahuta. So she controls all the funding and controls the marais. And by controlling the marais, she controls one side of the partnership. starting to control the other side of the partnership as well. So she's like a double controller, plus then she said that she I'm didn't recognise Tamawana Nui Akiwa in the court case yesterday. She claims to be the top diplomat of Tamawana Nui Akiwa. She claims to be the top diplomat of Tamawana Nui Kiwa. She controls all the marais and the Māori funding, and now she's controlling the government. It looks like um, done some sort of a deal with those guys to create what's happened now. Why is she interfering with our, our court cases now? That common law people should go and just do the decent common law stuff, that's and that's same. one aspect. And then the other aspect is Wakami or Nahapu. So the a dual sort of thing. Um, but the, it's the correct thing that was by the book, by the law. Yeah, of course, that's the the process of common law and street parliament and hapu. That's the same I think thing. that's why they're trying to snuff me out, Peter. And, and it's the same as the clan. Thing, yeah. But Nanaima Mahuda, I think she's thing. trying to snuff me out, particularly because she ordered my arrest after we passed that law. N Nanaima Mahuda stands to lose a lot if people's consciousnesses shift toward thinking that they have some sort of control over their lives and not the government. It's not only control over their lives, it's like caring for the environment and the animals as well. That's part of your life. Without that stuff... We can't live. We... If the environment's poisoned, we're dead. If the animals are gone, we're dead. And the whales. We're dead. If the sea dies, we're dead. Yeah. Yeah. We all know this stuff. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, um, yes, those things are life. So what happened to the other people in the Rainbow Warrior?
did they get targeted too? Or did they just oh. kill the one man and then... No, they, 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 they say they weren't trying to kill anyone, but it actually their whole process showed a reckless disregard for life. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that they were concerned not. At least I'll tell you one thing about the French government and the SAS man who did the bombing. At least he said sorry. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. At least they, they did apologise in some shape or form. But to be honest, a man was murdered. and For protecting the dolphins and the and whales. And no one has, you know, uh, been punished. Those, those two people and, 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 like, I only mentioned those two because they were the ones that were actually nabbed in the original investigation and let go. Um none of them have been brought to task for murdering that man. You know, because because they were acting under the orders and auspices of a government, right? How's that any different now? We've got a government doing the same thing now, but we can only see it when it's the French government doing it to us or when it's the South African government doing it to their people. We can't see it when it's our own government doing it to us. My role was to plant two bombs on the Rainbow Warrior. He led the dive team, he set the bombs. And for 30 years he remained hidden, guarding the secret of what really happened the night the Rainbow Warrior was sunk. For a member of a secret service, we never talk. But finally, he is talking. We were not cold-blooded killers. We did everything to preserve the life of the people on board of the Rainbow Warrior. From your point of view, was your part of the operation a success? No. Uh, for me, it was not successful. It was a, a big, big failure. July 1985. The Rainbow Warrior sails into Auckland's Waitemata Harbour, accompanied by a flotilla ready to join the Greenpeace ship at Muraroa Atoll to protest against French nuclear testing. We were preparing to go to French Polynesia where we we're going to protest the nuclear testing of France. But the French government had other ideas. It sent 13 members of its secret service, the DGSE, to sink the Rainbow Warrior before it left Auckland. The French had always claimed that they didn't want to kill anybody. But in my opinion, either they were blatantly incompetent or they didn't want to kill anybody. They really didn't care, care if they did. Just before midnight on July the 10th, two bombs exploded. The first blew a two square meter hole in the engine room. The second smaller bomb was attached to the keel. There's the force of the second explosion that I'm sure trapped him in the room. Two days after the bombing, detectives acting on a tip-off arrested two French agents, Dominic Prieur and Alain Marfar, traveling on fake passports, posing as Swiss honeymooners. The Uvea, a charter yacht which brought the bombs to New Zealand, was searched in Norfolk Island and then released. At first, discarded equipment, the only clues to the agents who planted the bombs. So who were they? How did they get away? We know that the French government ordered the attack to be carried out by the French Secret Service. But what about the agent responsible for planting the bombs that sank the Rainbow Warrior? This is Metz. 3,000-year-old city in Lorraine province. Jean -Luc. It's now home to Colonel Jean-Luc Keister, a former head of the combat dive team of the French Secret Service. So you put both the bombs on the hull yourself and set them? Yes, yes. Uh, I was the team leader. 
and uh, I had the responsibility uh, for this part of the operation. Colonel Keister remembers being surprised when told of the plan to stop the Rainbow Warrior. For us, uh, Greenpeace members were uh, engaged troublemakers, but not very dangerous. We were amazed that uh, such an operation can be conducted uh, on, uh, on there. But this was the time of the Cold War with the Soviets. We were told that uh, Greenpeace was infiltrated by the KGB. This was the explanation given to us. Jean-Luc Keister had become a military cadet at just 17. By 1985, he was a captain in the combat dive team, a highly trained professional soldier. So why was the decision taken to blow it up and sink it in Auckland Harbour? One option would have been to plant the bomb in Vanuatu or in Auckland and to delay the explosion uh, when the boat would be offshore. Uh, this was certainly the safest for the operators, but the more dangerous for the crew. And uh, it was immediately abandoned. Another option, to contaminate the ship's fuel with bacteria, was also abandoned. I don't know who decided to sink it, but it was clear that in Auckland this was certainly easier. And uh, the fact that the, the ship was docked was uh, less dangerous for uh, the crew because we thought also that due to the low tide even if the boat was sunk it will lay on the bottom not totally submerged it was decided that the explosion could occur around uh, midnight it was thought that nobody would be in the engine room why two bombs one bomb was uh, expected to make the people to evacuate the boat and the second to, to sink it. But Jean-Luc Kister has revealed that's not what happened. He placed the first larger bomb on the hull next to the engine room. It was decided by the chief of the operation to make the first one to explode in order that when the, there will be water in, inside the boat at that time, everybody will, uh, uh, will evacuate. But the ship sank much faster than they had expected. The second smaller bomb clamped on the keel was designed to keep people off the boat. But in fact, it killed a man. So how long was the delay between the two explosions? We trigger with a four minutes delay between the two bombs. Everything was done to prevent anybody to, to come back. Was four minutes really long enough, do you think, for people to evacuate? It was thought that it was enough time and we didn't expect the boat will sink so quickly. The plan was to sink the Rainbow Warrior while keeping the crew out of harm's way. But they got it wrong. One man paid for that mistake with his life. We now know the French agents blew a hole in the Rainbow Warrior far larger than they had expected. Before the bombing, combat divers were watching their target. And we have seen that there was a sailing ship along the, the rainbow. They had been ordered to place the first larger bomb portside, but realized this would have endangered anyone on board the yachts alongside. I decided to put it on the starboard of the boat, always thinking not to hurt anybody. There were three agents on the Zodiac carrying two bombs to sink the ship. Jean-Luc Kista and Jean Camas were the combat divers, Girard Royal, the boatman. The two combat divers slipped into the water and were towed under the inflatable and released 500 meters from their target. And we are linked together by a rope because we are operating in the darkness. Whereabouts on the boat did you set the bombs? On the hull. It was on the hull. Uh, on board, a birthday party is underway. We were quite fortunate because the first bomb blew a two by two meter hole right in the side of the hull. I mean, the boat sank in 45 seconds. When you were planting the bombs, were you aware that there were people on board? No, no, no we didn't know anything uh, on what was happening. Uh, and if there were some people on board, everything was done in order that they can evacuate. Wasn't there a real danger that the first blast could have killed people? No. 
we thought that uh, nobody would be in the engine room at midnight. This is a photograph of the damage done by the bomb. It's a big hole. A much bigger hole than you would have thought. We didn't expect to have a, such a large hole in the hull. There was shrapnel that ripped through the upper decks. Did you calculate that that could have killed people? No, it was not expected to have uh, any other damage. We had never the opportunity to test the real effect on a, a real uh, boat. Fortunately, no one was in the engine room or on the upper decks. Well, if the first bomb had gone off half an hour sooner, we would have lost 20 of us. In 1985, Peter Wilcox was the skipper of Rainbow Warrior. He was in bed asleep when the first bomb exploded. We barely had enough time to get everybody off. And not everybody did get off. That's Fernando in the marshals, I suspect. Fernando had been in the mess and had gone to his cabin to get his cameras. And that's when the second bomb went off. And the second bomb trapped him in his cabin and drowned him. The second smaller bomb, supposedly designed to keep the crew off the boat, caused the drowning of photographer Fernando Pereira. The captain of the Rainbow Warrior, Peter Wilcox, says that this was murder, that they knew there were people on board. Yes, I understand his point of view. Uh, but for us, on our side, we think that it was unfortunately an accidental death of an innocent Fernando Pereira. My dad has been murdered. I don't see it as manslaughter. I don't see it as um, accidental killing. Ten years ago, Sunday spoke to Fernando Pereira's daughter, Morella. She was just eight when her father died. Sometimes you think, why? I would like to take this opportunity given to me by the TV of New Zealand to express my deepest regrets and apologizes to Miss Marelle Pereira and her family uh, for the accidental death of Fernando Pereira. Thank you for being well. That's our greeting. And your answer is Kosha Dogus. Kosha Dogus. Yes, that's true. It's always about health. I've been uh, struggling these past few hours um, wondering how we're going to um, coordinate and work with these experienced gentlemen here uh, and all of their uh, abilities and all of their experience. One thing I've learned, you know, after all these years is experience counts. It's the best teacher. <clears throat> I had a, have a son, I called him Rex the hard way. Just the only way he learned was the hard way. <laughs> and so uh, that's been kind of my teacher as well. So I've been fortunate to go through all this uh, experiences and so forth. When we went to Geneva in 1977, I wondered why we had to, to make a new law for ourselves called the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Aren't we people? Don't we have rights? It took me a long time to find out about the doctrine. No, we're not people. Not in a complete sense, we're told. I said, oh, really? And so finally, 2007, the United Nations 
adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was over a 30-year fight that I was engaged in, our nations were engaged in. Many, many of those leaders went home and were shot and killed. Today, now, And so, finally, 2007, the United Nations adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It was over a 30-year fight that I was engaged in, our nations were engaged in. Many, many of those leaders went home and were shot and killed. Today, now, so here we are, worried about seven generations and dealing with very, very serious problems at home. You know, this is a racist country, has been for a long time. And you're having problems with that right now. You've got a front runner in the GOP who's doing some dangerous, dangerous stirring. That, that's not good stuff that he's stirring up there. Not good. Pushing the wrong buttons, but getting a strong reaction. So, that yeah, we should have a different new president. Else has been there and done that. Yeah, there. Leave me alone. <laughs>